Good morning and welcome to Sustainability First's uh, webinar with Slaughter and May. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, this webinar is looking at how far current arrangements uh, in legal and regulatory frameworks in public utilities deliver for sustainability and the vexed question of whether further legislation is required. I'm Sharon Darcy and I'm the Director of Sustainability First. If you don't know us, we're a think tank and a charity, and we look at sustainability in the round. So environmental, social and economic sustainability. And we have a particular interest in sustainability uh, in essential services, in the energy, water and communication sectors. I'd very much like to welcome our fantastic panel this morning. We're going to hear from Jeff Twentyman, who's Slaughter and May's partner and who is head of sustainability for the firm. From Elizabeth Taylor, um, who is another partner at Slaughters and May. We're also joined by Catherine Ross, who's the group director of regulations for the BET group. And Catherine is also chair of the government's regulatory horizons council. And Dermot Nolan. Uh, Dermot is a director at Fingleton and was until recently chief executive at Ofgem. So, it's great to be joined by such a good panel. Today, we'll be discussing the work that Slaughter and May have done for sustainability pro bono on the interrelationship between sustainability, law and regulation. So a really important theme. Uh, it's an extensive piece of work and it's taken quite a lot of time. And I'd also like to thank, as well as Isabel and Jeff, Philip MacDonald, who's helped lead this work at Slaughter's and whose dedication to the cause has been great. Um, I'd like to also thank some of the experts who gave their comments on the drafts of the papers, um, particularly Claire Milne and Chris Taylor, um, and some of our sponsors who also helped guide us uh, in this work. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the Sustainability First team, in particular Fiona Smith, Maxine Ferk, and Martin Hurst, and Alice um, Cross, our researcher, who's done a heroic job of summarising Slaughter's vast um, swathe of material into a really good two-side briefing paper. I really hope you read the papers, and if you haven't, please do read Alice's summary, and it'll give you a taste of what we've done. So before we get started, this webinar is being recorded and we're going to put it up on YouTube live afterwards. We'll also be doing some social media coverage. So if you're into Twitter, please um, do tweet about it under the hashtag sustainable utilities. Now, our agenda today is going to start with a bit of background from me in terms of the context in which this work is taking place. We're then going to hear from the Slaughters team Jeff is going to tell us why Slaughter's did this work for us and what he thought when he sort of started looking at the analysis. Was he surprised? Was this what he expected? Then Isabel is going to take us through some of the common themes uh, that their works explored and look at some of the particular issues for the sectors that they looked at, the water, energy and comm sectors. We're then going to hear responses to the Slaughter's work from Catherine and from Dermot. And then we'll have a panel discussion. There will then be a chance for your questions. So please do submit your questions um, using the question button at the bottom of your screens. Martin Hurst, my colleague, will then take us through the questions and we'll end with some next steps. So that's our agenda. Sustainability First has been looking at the issue of uh, sustainability fairness and purpose in utilities since 2018. Our major Fair for the Future project um, spent its first two years looking at what sustainability and purpose really mean uh, for public utility companies and how companies can put it into practice. It's vital that companies play their role in delivering sustainable outcomes. They have to step up to the plate to deliver on some of these crucial social and environmental issues that we all in society are struggling with. If they want to be seen as responsible businesses, this is absolutely key. But companies can't do this alone. They operate in legal and regulatory frameworks, 
And that's why we asked Slaughter and May to help us with this work. We wanted to understand how far the current arrangements really help or hinder sustainability. Their extensive work is up on our website and today we'll be exploring some of this. Um, we will though, after this webinar, be taking forward the thinking that slaughters have done for us in our own Sustainability First report, for the Fair for the Future project, which will look at sustainability and purpose and the implications this has for policy and regulation. And that will be coming out at the end of next month and is going to be followed by a major conference where we'll be delighted to be joined by the new energy minister, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, along with Rachel Fletcher, chief exec of Ofwat, and Professor Colin Mayer, who's an international expert on issues of purpose. But I think everybody in the webinar today is absolutely aware that the this issue of sustainability is taking place against a very dynamic backdrop. And there's been a lot of change in the last few months in terms of the frameworks that underpin some of the issues around social and environmental impacts. It's a changing, shifting landscape. In the months before Christmas, we were deluged by the government's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, the six carbon budget, uh, changes around environmental legislation, a new national infrastructure strategy, an energy white paper, um, and not forgetting the CMA conclusions around the PR19 price review in water. So there is a lot going on. And of course, this is taking place against the backdrop of COVID and Brexit. Government bandwidth is severely limited. So the ability to get change in legal and regulatory frameworks is limited by the reality that we're all facing. And at the same time, the challenges we are facing are being exacerbated. COVID is sharpening inequalities and really adding to the affordability challenge, whilst also providing some real uh, life innovation in terms of technology and behaviour change. So it is a moving picture that we're looking at and the goalposts are changing. When we asked Slaughters and May to look at this work, we asked them to do so through six different dimensions of sustainability. The first three are really around goals. We think sustainability is important to deliver long-term and intergenerational outcomes and to address those issues. We think it's important that it is people-centered and takes into account local and regional issues. And we think it's important, obviously, to preserve the environment and reduce pollution. But we also are slaughtered to identify and to look at three other dimensions of sustainability in terms of how you deliver on those goals. And the dimensions we identified were short-term flexibility, the need for investment in innovation, and crucially, collaboration. As everyone on this webinar will be aware of, there are massive trade-offs between these different dimensions of sustainability. And that's why legal and regulatory frameworks are important and can be difficult to get right. Slaughter's produced sector-specific papers, as well as a definitional paper for the purposes of this project on the energy, water and communication sectors. Their overall conclusion is there's actually a tremendous degree of flexibility within current legal and regulatory frameworks. So the message from today is really that no one should be hiding behind the law or regulation as an excuse not to be sustainable. And that applies to companies, regulators, policymakers, and of course, politicians. The key issue is how you interpret and implement the law. But I think it's important to also recognise that Slaughter's work for us was sector specific, looking at regulation and law in specific sectors. There are clearly issues around the law in terms of wider corporate governance and in terms of issues such as carbon taxing and pricing. But what this work really shows is that all sides need to take responsibility if we're going to deliver sustainable outcomes. And I'd like to hand over first off to Jeff Twentyman from Slaughters to get Jeff's view about 
the work that has been done um, by his team and what that looks like. Jeff, thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am, as Sharon mentioned, the head of sustainability at Slaughter and May, but I, I'm, I've been repurposed into that role. Um, I'm a, a corporate uh, lawyer. Uh, I'm also head of private equity. So I, I come at this particular subject as a, uh, as a generalist. And when you hear from Isabel, um, you'll appreciate the difference um, between us uh, in terms of expertise. Um, I'm delighted we've got this far. This has been about a year of working with Sustainability First, uh, and it's been a, um, a really interesting exercise for us. Law firms are, of course, um, uh, their own regulated sector, and we are one of the very few, perhaps the only sector uh, in the economy where we are required to provide our services for free. So uh, hence the, the, the long history of, of, of lawyers providing pro bono services. There are even league tables to show how much of it we've done. And historically that meant engaging with law centers and, and helping those who needed our help um, very much at the sort of retail end of the spectrum and occasionally supporting big charitable projects. But the, the, the more modern way of thinking about pro bono is to try and think of ways to deploy our services and use our influence strategically and to support system change uh, as opposed to the sort of historical, almost philanthropic uh, way of going about pro bono activity. But to do that strategically is not without its challenge because lawyers, there is a perception that lawyers are, a, if you like, a neutral platform and that we are an agent of our clients' purposes rather than uh, having views of our own. Uh, and this is an increasingly sort of hot topic in the professional services world. And as, a, as an aside, I think that um, that sort of received view is, is actually difficult to accept. We are a, a big business. We have responsibilities like any other business. And, and I don't think that it's viable for us to claim to be pro-sustainability uh, if we don't actually make choices. But nevertheless, when Sharon explained what she was asking us to do, I did see this as an opportunity to use a, a, an area of deep expertise for us strategically and I hope neutrally. Um, and of course, I came at this as a corporate lawyer with a quite a simplistic preconception and I think my expectation was that our analysis would show that the regulatory regime was indeed an obstacle um, and the task for us would be to look at that objectively and unpick it uh, and I think the results as Sharon has uh, anticipated in her remarks that, that they show something different and, and if the conclusion is that the rules themselves are not an insurmountable issue, then our focus has to go elsewhere. What else holds us back? And, and if we perceive that the direction of travel is insufficiently rapid or insufficiently oriented to sustainable outcomes, when, then what, what is the reason for this? And what we see here, and what we'll discuss in this webinar, are themes that actually I see across many other sectors, possibly all of them to a greater or lesser extent. Every sector thinks it has its unique challenges, but disappointingly, uh, in a holistic sense, that these challenges are not unique, but are, are familiar. And that the themes we're going to come to are short termism and long termism, political will, the presumption of consumer interest as paramount, which is, if you like, the the, the economic foundation that, that we are consumers above all, that externalities are not properly priced, like pre-financial metrics, and of course the balance of shareholder and stakeholder interests. And in this sector, just in every other sector, we have to ask ourselves the question in modern parlance, what is the corporate purpose and what is the right corporate form uh, for businesses in this sector? I'm struck also by an analogy, which is part of my day job, which is the regular clamour to change the law of fiduciary duties. 
there's no indication of any appetite in government to do this. And the received wisdom is that it will be very difficult to come up with a, an alternative system, which you know, sounds very similar to our subject matter today. But when you look at the existing model, you know, long-term interests, stakeholders expressly relevant, if you like the enlightened shareholder value, and you look at the way in which ESG and sustainability issues of real financial materiality and relevance, and that the social license to operate uh, is a dynamic concept and has shifted very noticeably recently. Uh, and the system was designed to be flexible. So arguably it's not the rules that need changing, but the, the way that decisions are made within the rules uh, that needs changing. Uh, and on that point, I'm going to hand over now to Isabel to introduce more of the detail. Hi, I'm Isabel Taylor. I'm a partner in the competition group at Slaughter Um as And as well as doing mainstream competition, or I do quite a lot of work in, with the, in relation to either the public sector or regulated sectors. So I think we came to this project, you know, with experience of the regulatory model in the context of price controls, regulatory interventions, state aid applications. Um, but this was probably the first time uh, we'd been asked to look at um, the model of utility regulation in the UK, I guess, as a model and, and specifically from a sustainability perspective. Um, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes just sort of trying to give an overview of what we looked at and where we got to. Um, the key question we were asked to consider was whether and if so, in what way the legal and the regulatory regime might place barriers on the ability of companies and regulators to pursue sustainability objectives? Now, um, that's quite a big question. And the first, our first step in thinking about that was really a discussion that we had with the Sustainability First team about you know, what we actually mean by sustainability in this context. And that led to you know, what we call the definitional paper, which is included in our pack of papers. And that identified six broad categories of issue um, within the concept of sustainability. So long-term intergenerational issues, people-centered services and localism, environment and emissions, short-term flexibility, investment and innovation and collaboration. And we should maybe say at the outset, what we weren't trying to do there was come up with you know, our own, you know, law firm version of a comprehensive definition of sustainability. And we obviously also lent on the, the many um, expert attempts that have been made to define sustainability. But um, so I, I don't think I see that paper as intended to be a sort of all purpose statement of what sustainability means in the regulated sectors. But the aim of it was to give us a framework that we could use to help direct the analysis and structure our thinking um, around the different sectors. And one thing that I think was quite interesting from this work was the extent to which the particular circumstances of each sector did make a difference to the issues that we were picking up and discussing in the context of each work stream. So, you know, in water, for instance, you know, you're coming to a regime where there is already a very specific and quite prescriptive regime already in place in relation to environmental protection. And a lot of um, time is spent on that, you know, in, in the water sector, but it's it's already hardwired into the regime. Um, it's also a sector where there's quite a lot of thinking that's been done about issues around long-term investment and the interaction between um, long-term investment projects and the price control regime. Although there's perhaps less examples of, you know, they've come up with models in water to try and address those tensions, but although there's perhaps less examples of those models actually being implemented once you go beyond the Thames Tideway. Um, in energy, um, you know, the really obvious point about energy is that the key issue in the sector at the moment is the net zero challenge and really um, so when you're looking at investment and infrastructure in the energy sector, the, the scale and the scope of the investment that's likely to require, I think really means it's not being thought about in terms of funding through the price control at all. Um, and there's some very clear needs in that sector for, 
you know, government or some other kind of central intervention to coordinate, manage, and, and frankly, directly support the financing of, of some of the investment that's required. Um, and telecoms is different again. I mean, it's quite noticeable when you start reading, you know, around the telecom sector that sustainability issues are less to the forefront of the regulatory agenda than you see in, in water and in energy. Um, I think the issues in telecoms are also quite nuanced because whilst, you know, telecoms as a sector has um, sustainability challenges, it's, it's, it's a major user of energy, um, it's also a facilitator of technology, so video calling or you know, Zoom calls um, that might have a that have a very positive or potential for a very positive impact on sustainability, but maybe not in the telecom sector or in other sectors. Um, so, so you know, there are differences. Is first point. Um, but that said, the key conclusion that I think we came to that really we thought held across all of the sectors is that we. We don't think that the legal and regulatory regime in principle creates you know, much in the way of barriers to the pursuit of sustainability initiatives. The, the legal regime sets up a framework for the regulation of each sector, but there's actually very little within those regimes that's prescribed in terms of what the regulators do, what the terms of the licenses and the authorizations are, what funding is allowed through the price control. So for instance, there's nothing that says how long a price control period has to be. In energy, there has been a bit of experimenting with changing the duration. Nothing that says how much funding should be allowed or what it can be allowed for, or even the basis on which prices are set. RPI minus X or Rio is not hardwired into the regime. That's not intended to say that the regulatory regime as it's operated in practice is irrelevant to the pursuit of sustainability objectives. I mean, clearly there are choices being made all the time and certainly at every price control review by regulators about what activities it's reasonable to require companies to do and what and what is it reasonable to ask customers to pay for. And within that, we've touched on this already, there are trade-offs that have to be made against other objectives. Um, the most obvious being investor certainty, that the point of the price control is supposed to be to give certainty. And that is relevant to the sustainability agenda as well as to investors because it impacts on financing costs. Um, but probably the more uh, front of mind trade off is, is affordability. And, you know, I think it, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that what we're talking about here is water, power, telecoms that they're essential services and they're essential services that actually a chunk of the population is already struggling to pay the bills on. Um, at the same time, if you are just pushing deferring expenditure that should be done now and pushing it into the future, you are basically pushing those costs onto um, uh, the people in the future that will find it difficult to pay the bills. so that there is an intergenerational issue pushing costs into the future isn't necessarily fair either. It's also the case that not all sustainability initiatives cost money, even in the short term. Um, and it's not all about the regulatory regime. You know, regulated companies can and do fund um, initiatives out of their own pocket. And there's examples of this noted in all of our papers. Um, at the same time, you know, I don't think we can ignore the fact that what funding is available and the broader incentives in the financing and regulatory regime are going to be key drivers of behavior. That's that's not just because the funding itself obviously provides an incentive to activity. If it's funded, it's easier to do it. But it's also about the, um, uh, the penalties and sanctions that exist within the regulatory regime uh, mean that if you are a regulated company, your first incentive is to deliver on your mandatory obligations and anything voluntary and above that is going to come next in, in the priority order. So, so what's in the regime does matter. And you know, I've maybe made it sound a bit black and white and, you know, nothing is quite that straightforward. We do identify some specific areas where we thought the legal regime does impose some level of constraint. So um, in the telecom sector, the fact that at least up until now, the regulatory regime has been aligned with EU rules does place some limits on the ability of regulators or lawmakers to impose additional obligations on, on regulated companies. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that it is quite difficult to fund very long term investments through a price control that's only fixed for a given period of time, whatever that 
here it is. Um, we also discuss in our papers, and we might come back to this, you know, concerns that um, the scale of the penalties that exist for breaches of competition law might have a chilling effect on incentives to collaborate effectively because you know the downside of getting it wrong is vastly in excess of the potential upside of, of successful collaboration um, and we also touch on the role of directors duties in influencing the decision making of companies we also spent quite a bit of time thinking about the role of regulators duties in the mix um, those obviously do at some level impose a constraint on what regulators can do in that you know a decision that could be shown to be manifestly incompatible with the statutory objectives it you know, could be challengeable as a matter of public law i think you know when we were looking at the sectors we didn't really identify examples of situations where regulators had um you know refused to take action or expressed themselves as unable to take action because of those um duties so you know whilst you know those are you know at one level legal constraints it seemed to us that in practice the duties on regulators are are probably more significant as behavioral nudges that force consideration of specific issues but that might be a point that we want to come back um and discuss you know later on in the context of whether sustainability issues need to be more visible in that hierarchy of regulatory concerns um, we also tried to make some practical suggestions about things that could be done differently in the current framework if you wanted to um, you know, try and give a greater priority to sustainability initiatives. Most of those are really about trying to think of different ways that signals could be given to try to influence behaviour, whether that's in the form of policy statements from the government to the regulator, guidance from the competition authorities to companies, specific regulatory guidance on the approach to sustainability issues or um, we also touched on transparency measures to try to um, prioritize and publicize consideration of the issues and, and you know, keep the agenda live but I think fundamentally it seems to me that if there's a desire to get more done in the regulated sectors um, then what's really required to push it forward is to build a consensus across government regulators businesses and consumers first of all on what that looks like and you know what 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 is the objective what are we trying to achieve and then second we need to have an understanding of how it's going to be paid for whether that's through bills or by shareholders or through taxes and i think if you have that consensus in place then I think by and large, you'd find that the regulatory regime would largely be able to flex to accommodate it. Um, so that is that is what we were trying to say in our papers, but I think I am handing over now to um, Catherine or Dermot to, uh, to give their perspective on that. Thanks, Isabel. I, I think you're you're handing over to me. I'm I'm Catherine Ross. I'm Group Director of Regulatory Affairs for BT, and I also chair the government's Regulatory Horizons Council. Uh, and I used to be at Offwatt, and all of those things may come together a little bit in my five minute reaction to uh, the piece of work that we've got before us. Um, first thing to say is thank you so much uh, to the team at Slaughters for doing this. I think it's a fantastic piece of work, hugely comprehensive, and it's it's always really instructive to see cross sector approaches pulled together. Uh, and something like this, so it's it's great. Um, I don't think there was actually that much in uh, the paper that really surprised me. Uh, the vast majority of what was in there really, really resonated. Um, the main thing I think that struck me actually was the sheer scale and complexity uh, of the issue of sustainability and, and just what a, an all pervasive concept uh, genuine sustainability actually is and therefore how profound the changes uh, that are needed in order really to embed that concept of sustainability in everything we do how profound those changes are actually going to be um, some of the themes that came across are definitely a theme of complexity i think within that a, a theme of interdependency which i think takes you very quickly uh, to realize the need for some genuine systems thinking uh, if we're really going to land this 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 concept of sustainability, um, and also a need for long termism. So just to draw out uh, a few sort of sub themes there that perhaps have particular resonance uh, 
for companies. Um, I think the first one I draw out is the need for companies really to embrace uncertainty. Um, and I say that because certainly in my observation, uh, companies tend to want to do the reverse. Uh, and in particular, investors tend to want to do the reverse. There is a great clamoring uh, for greater certainty. And as we see uh, the environment in which we operate become more and more uncertain, there is a greater and greater clamoring for, for, for more certainty. Um, and I think companies really need to find a framework for decision making that enables them to make sensible commercial decisions um, that actually take account of the real uncertainty in their businesses and in the environment that they work in, rather than assuming it away, or perhaps assuming uh, that somebody else's problem and somebody else will, uh, will, will deal with that. And obviously scenario planning is a big part of that, uh, but also maybe sort of developing real options type approaches. And I think where you have companies that are in regulated sectors, that's something that companies and regulators will need to work together on because of course it will flow through into business plans that regulators will, will need to assess. So embracing uncertainty was, was one thing I thought was worth calling out. Um, another, and I think this, this comes across really strongly in, in the paper, is the need for more collaboration. Um, and that's collaboration, frankly, everywhere. Uh, collaboration uh, between companies with government and with regulators uh, to try and find the win-win, to try and find solutions that work, yes, in terms of benefits for, for shareholders, but also for customers, for citizens, and actually, frankly, for the effectiveness uh, of the entire regime. But also, and I think the paper does a jo good job in drawing this out, the need for more collaboration between companies, uh, possibly within sectors, uh, certainly between sectors, and again, that is not often the first instinct of, of a company. You, know, you try and focus on the stuff that you can control that's within your universe, but actually just widening the box and reaching out uh, to others uh, is often uh, the best way forward. Uh, and I think the paper does a good job also of drawing out uh, the effect of uh, regulatory obligations and competition law there, uh, perhaps in chilling some of that collaboration. I, I, I've seen that, uh, and I do think we'll probably discuss later on whether there is something competition authorities and regulators could do to just unchill um, the, uh, the, the extent of collaboration, certainly in the commercial sector. Another thing I wanted to draw out uh, is this need for long-term thinking. Um, and on the one hand, you look at a lot of these companies, uh, a lot of them are network companies uh, whose future income uh, and future prosperity depends on the performance of their assets. Uh, over the long term. And you, so you look at these companies and you say, well, obviously, long term thinking uh, must be in their DNA. And, and to some extent, that's true. But I also don't think you can underestimate the extent to which there are genuine, real short term pressures uh, on companies. Um, and I think, you know, Isabel was right to say this. It is, it is certainly not always the case that doing the sustainable thing uh, that is good for the long term has a short term cost. But sometimes it does. Um, and there is a constraint on how much of that short term cost a company can bear and still deliver the return that its investors were expecting uh, in the time period in which they were expecting it. And I suppose where this where this takes me is really to the importance uh, of companies uh, you know, bringing their investors along with them uh, on this journey, because uh, I, I think explaining why the long term matters and being quite clear about the kind of company you are uh, and what your investors are getting when they invest in, in, in you and this type of company uh, is, is really important. I, I think regulators and government shouldn't expect that to be a quick process. Uh, th those kinds of changes, those kinds of dialogues take time, uh, but very, very important. Um, and actually, there are things regulators can do, I think, to help there as well in terms of setting out some long term principles in terms of their own direction of travel and elements of their framework that will endure over the long term so that we can focus in uh, the debate with our investors on the stuff that we, we do need to, to think of as, as less certain uh, where we need to plot a path through the long term. Um, I think the final thing I wanted to highlight is one of the things that comes through the paper in spades, I think, um, is about the prevalence of trade-offs in this debate, you know, long-term, short-term, you know, customers, citizens, uh, you know, different uh, geographical areas, different groups in society. And I think that that's, we're not going to escape that, right? But whenever you have those kinds of trade-offs, one of the things you can do to just ease those trade-offs at the margin um, is to improve efficiency. 
And that kind of takes me to, to thinking that one of the things that we do really need to focus on if we are going to deliver a more sustainable future is how we steam out every last opportunity for efficiency, in particular uh, through seeking out uh, more innovation. Uh, and I think this is something that, that companies obviously need to take a leading role in. It's, it's, it's going to be the companies that, that deliver this kind of innovation. And again, looking beyond your own boundaries as perhaps a larger regulated company and partnering with some of the smaller, more disruptive companies, really, really important there. Um, but also, again, things regulators can help on, you know, um, we, we've got regulators with some prizes for innovation, that's one option, but also just expanding the choice set um, for those make or buy decisions, the kind of thing that offwat has been doing with direct procurement for customers, um, for example. Um, and also just generally moving towards a more anticipatory regulatory approach. But if we can, if we can make the cake bigger, then the tensions around the, the relative size of the different slices just becomes that much easier to deal with. So I think in summary, I, I very much agree with, with, with Sharon's point at the beginning. Companies need to step up to the plate here. We need to understand, genuinely understand the part that we play uh, in the systems that underpin our economy and society. And we need to embrace that role. Uh, and we need to embrace the uncertain context in which that role uh, exists. Uh, and really focus on doing what we can do, including partnering with others to really improve the sustainability across the whole system. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Dermot. Thank you, Catherine. Um, hi, I'm Dermot Nolan. I'm sort of um, director in Fingleton, which was a company set up by my old friend John Fingleton that does strategic advice in, in competition and regulation. But before that, I was CEO of Ofgem for uh, a number of years. So I um, have sort of relatively uh, recent experience, if you like, at the coal front. I'm not sure if coal front is a particularly appropriate uh, image in the context of sustainability, um, but nonetheless, I've used it. Um, I'm going to take, I've talked with Catherine in advance and we prepared and she was company, coming more from the company perspective. So I'm going to come a little bit more from the regulatory perspective. Um, but I should say again, I very much welcome the work that um, Thought has done. It's a hugely comprehensive set of papers very thorough, very, very useful in, in and of itself. Um, and also I'd like to thank Sustainability First for promulgating the whole idea, if you will. But in some fashion, I was also not that surprised by the main, most of the conclusions slaughterers came out with, the sense that in sense, sense that there is flexibility already within the system. And it's a matter in some sense of finding the will for both regulators and, rel and companies and indeed government to actually um, use the framework that is there but as I will touch on briefly, that is bedeviled by a degree of tension. And I very much agree with what Isabel said about the idea of a forming consensus, but there are difficulties within that. Uh, difficulties I think that we clearly need to surmount, but there are difficulties and I will touch on those briefly in the next few minutes. Let me just say a little bit about sort of the, my experience as a regulator myself. I mean, I joined in 2014 and off gem when there was, and Maxine will know this well, huge upset about rising energy prices. Um, and that was very much the theme of the day. And I have to say as CEO, I, I perhaps completely unreasonably thought that, you know, sustainability and here I'm using it perhaps in a narrower sense in terms of carbon emissions were not, so to speak, my problem or certainly not my primary duty. That should not necessarily uh, in any sense imply that I'm anything other than actually very green, if I may say so. But nonetheless, I didn't think it was a primary duty in some fashion. I thought it was a, in some sense, a prime, something that the government was taking, taking the lead on, which in many ways it was. And I would say for three or four years within Ofgen, that was the primary lens through which I, and to some extent the board, looked at most of our duties, as it were. We thought we wanted to be consistent with decarbonization, but we did not see it as in some sense the sine qua non of, of our activities. And that was pervasive across all of, of, all of Ofgen's activities, I would say at the time. Now, that may have been a mistake, says there's nothing more than a reformed sinner, as it were, to show the values of repentance. But I suppose in my last two years on Ofgem, I, I did begin to reflect, partially through conversations I'd had over years, partially through talking with new NEDs, partially actually, perhaps most importantly, talking with many of the, the staff at Ofgem, who felt they had joined the regulator to help create a more sustainable and, and decarbonized society. And the last year or two, we, we, we came out with a different kind of strategy, which placed sustainability uh, in the, in again, in the more narrow sense, perhaps of decarbonizing emission of the, the economy as a more important goal than we had previously done so. And in fact, a central goal in Ofgem's new strategy, as it were. And as I said, that, that was perhaps late, but better late than never. Um, 
And one thing we found linking back very much to Slaughter's uh, work in this was that it was capable, we were capable of doing so within the existing legislative framework. The primary duty of Ofgem is to protect the short and long run, uh, the primary, uh, sorry, purpose of Ofgem, my apologies, is to protect the um, short and long run uh, objectives of, of, of energy customers. Then there are a range of other duties beyond that, some of which might be construed as contradictory to each other. But we found the primary sort of purpose, as it were, gave us that flexibility to think about um, things in a sustainable, decarbonized and long run fashion. So in that sense, we found while developing this kind of way of thinking further that we did, as Slaughter's would have suggested, have the flexibility in our legal framework to allow us to make decarbonizing uh, the energy system a core objective of ours. Um, and I think that that does show essentially the Slaughter's point. I will say in my last year, despite this, and um, based on some of the interactions I've had with government over the last six years, and I'm not saying they were all negative, they were usually very positive, though we obviously had our, had our disagreements. I said, I thought there was a value, and I still have this value, that despite that, still have this belief, that despite that flexibility, it would be good, frankly, if, off, if Ofgem was given a statutory objective vis-a-vis uh, -vis net zero. Um, and I retain that belief now. I think within Ofgem, there's a degree of nervousness in it. I'm not speaking for Ofgem, obviously, but I think there is some nervousness as to, and the way you frame any such statutory objective will necessarily be capable of being interpreted in a number of ways. People will have different views of, of, of what it entails and, and applying it will be non-straightforward. But I think nonetheless, it would be valuable both as a signal and both as a way of giving more legal certainty to any regulatory bodies that are actually saying, right, net zero is our objective. How do we achieve it in the cheapest way possible um, for consumers at any rate? And the point I made earlier, I suppose I will return to and but hopefully not take too much longer, was the sense of tensions and consensus. I will say certainly within the price controls and off-gem, and I am, I suppose, more concentrating on energy, but I think you saw it in water and in a slightly different kind of way in telecoms. Certainly with regard to network price controls, there was a sense in Rio 1 that companies had done, if you will, extremely well, and perhaps not all because of their, their skill and innovat innovative abilities, but had got higher returns than expected, which led to a shy, I can say, a, a suspicion within Ofgem and perhaps within other regulators that, frankly, this wasn't going to happen again, um, that you know, future returns would be lower because future returns were going to be lower because that's, that's, in some sense, our job to protect consumers. And there was this tension and suspicion. In Rio 1, I think it was probably fair to say there'd been a sense of, well, we have to decarbonize the power system through renewables and we want all this kind of build. And as a result, I think, not all that bill turned out to be necessary, but yet was funded. And Ofgem was very nervous about this happening again in Rio too, and hence skeptical when companies say, came across along and said quite properly, well, in fact, what we have here is a situation where we're going to have to completely change our economy to achieve net zero, and we need massive investments. And Ofgem was skeptical in the sense of, hmm, I'm not so sure about that, or at least I certainly was um, at, at the time. Perhaps my, my successors have been wiser in that regard. So that, those kinds of tensions are hugely difficult, I think, to deal with, but nonetheless have to be dealt with. And Isabel's earlier point, which was confirmed, I think, by Catherine, which is that we need consensus, is, is difficult but necessary. And I think the most difficult task of the next two or three years will be finding that degree of consensus, finding those tensions, suspicions, those short-run issues about bills versus the long run, bringing them into some sort of consensus, Isabel also mentioned the question of who pays, or maybe perhaps it was Jeff. Uh, there was the sense of, well, should it be paid through bills? Should it be paid through, as was said, shareholder uh, returns? Or should it be built, paid through by taxation? I actually thought in many ways, taxation was a, was, would be a very good way to pay for any increase in cost due to sustainability, uh, simply because it's far more progressive than other forms. Um, but nonetheless, I think we look at a COVID situation in a treasury that frankly has no money left. Um, and we think that's going to be very unlikely. So it's that, that, that way in which we are going to bring the tensions that I've referred to, and I must say are very much still there, bring those tensions into some form of overall consensus, a form of overall consensus that is not going to be, I'm not going to be overly lurid here, uh, but consistent with the kind of way Britain transformed itself in the Second World War. Those kinds of huge changes are necessary to take place. And I hope we can discuss those in the, in the questions that follow.
Thank you very much, Dermot um, and Catherine and Jeff and Isabel. Uh, we had some really stimulating uh, thoughts there for, from everyone. Uh, we're now going to move to a panel session um, to have a bit of a discussion um, and open up. So if I could invite members of the panel to sort of put their videos on, uh, that would be great. Um, and as they do so, please do, uh, members of the audience, please do put in your questions on the Q&A uh, so far. Um, we've got a really good one from Rich Hall at Citizens Advice already, but I'm sure other people uh, have lots of views on what's been said so far. So I'd like to kick off by asking the panel whether there's any particular dimensions of sustainability that they think current arrangements really struggle to deal with. We've heard from both Isabel and Catherine that collaboration is a bit of an issue. Um, and particularly given the number of competition lawyers uh, attending the webinar, I'd really welcome panel members insights on that point, but also from others, whether there are other areas of sustainability that are often overlooked. And one of the things that hasn't really come out so far in the comments is the people-centered and local dimension of sustainability. So is that something that panel members think might be an issue? Um, so I'd like to start, if I may, by asking Jeff uh, for his views um, on whether there's any particular aspects of sustainability that are an issue. Well, I, I, again, I, I think the my response to that is one which is, if you like, agnostic to the sectors again, that, that um, you know, what the last 12 months has, has thrown into the spotlight is, if you like, the under appreciation of, of social issues. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, uh, uh, you know, and one of one of which is, the, if you like, the tangibility of it. But I, I was, you know, I noticed yesterday um, a new survey that's gone out from, it's the, the Schroeder's Global Investor Study 2020. Um, and they asked the question of their 23,000 surveyed participants, you know, what they thought were the most important company behaviours and 70% uh, responded social responsibility, impact on communities and society. So I think it's, it's a much more difficult issue to conceive um, uh, of than the environmental aspects, but I, I think that it's, it's a it's a late runner, if you like, in this in this race. So I, I think that's that would be my answer. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Isabel, do you do you have any any views on that that social angle? Um, well, I think coming at it from the perspective of the work we did, I'd say I think the people centred services element is probably the hardest to pin down in terms of a question about the legal framework, because I think it is, if not subjective, it's a lot of what the concepts of people centred services are getting at is about, seems seems to me at least, some, some the, to be about how you take decisions and, and the process by which you gather information and you bring people along with you and the factors you take into account. So um, I think that is quite difficult to prescribed for in the legal regime it's behavioral rather than rather than legal um and maybe just to, i was also going to pick up on i thought i probably i should pick up on the competition law point that you raised um i mean i think that is a real i think fear of getting competition or wrong is a real issue and it's it's one that you see across across all sectors i think it's the issue is not actually the substance of the law i think generally speaking for where, where you've got pro-competitive collaboration, the law does allow that. You, you maybe have to be a bit careful about how you do it. I think the issue is the uncertainty about whether you're on the right side of the line and you know, the scale of the penalty for getting it wrong. Um, so so I, think the, I think when we're thinking about the competition or issues, it's less a question of like, is the law wrong? But how do we help people navigate the law in a way that, you know, doesn't just load masses of cost onto the project? Thanks, Isabel. Catherine, are there any issues that worry you in terms of, 
dimensions of sustainability that current arrangements aren't helping with? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are a few. Um, and I suppose, if I, if I can put it this way, less on the legal framework in, 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 in the strict sense, because I think, I think what actually one of the great benefits of, of, of the UK legal framework for regulation is actually regulators do have a great deal of discretion. You know, they have some duties and they have some powers, but they have a lot of discretion about what they can do to achieve those duties using those powers and frankly, other powers beyond that. So I, I'm not feeling unduly constrained by, by the law, but, th and I'm putting my ex-regulator hat on here, some of the issues that we've been talking about here with, with, with for example, you know, trade-offs between different groups in society these are very uncomfortable things for regulators to, to, to do. They can. There's nothing in the legal framework that stops a regulator making those kinds of tra trade-offs and cascading them into the regulatory framework, and they kind of do all the time. But you're always slightly nervous about whether you should be doing that. And to go back to Dermot's point, sh shouldn't the democratically elected government give you some cover or at least some guidance or some steer about where it wants to land that, because otherwise you feel like you're slightly you know, fly, flying somewhere out there on your own. And I think this picks up the point that you raised uh, in, in, in the paper, in the discussion about, you know, changes to the framework of, of government in, in, in this country as well, because you're not only talking about trade-offs between different groups in society, different customer groups, citizens, et cetera, et cetera. You, you now also have, um, a regulatory regime that is more or less clear in terms of the relationship between central government and regulators. We now have devolved governments in, 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 in Scotland and Wales. You know, you can see Ofwat, for example, has a different, uh, you know, strategic policy statement from, from DEFRA on behalf of the, the UK government slash England um, and Wales on behalf of the Welsh you know, people. Uh, they're not entirely the same. So where does that take you? And then also you do quite rightly have an increasing voice uh, from, you know, mayors in, in, in city regions. That's great because, you know, there, there's a direct legitimacy to those voices that come precisely from their local accountability. But actually, if everything we've just talked about is about the need for more systems thinking and a joined up approach, how the hell is a regulator supposed to do that? And what is a company supposed to make of that? So I think it's less about the law that it is about the institutional framework that really could use some clarity if we're not going to default to people being risk averse and incrementalist when that's the worst thing that we could do. Thank you. D Dermot, uh, does that inspire any particular reflections from you? Well, briefly, as the last comment Catherine made it actually does inspire an, an anecdote where, uh, hopefully a brief anecdote where, I mean, to give an example, Manchester decided it was going to be EV city, as it were, in the last two, three years. We got various submissions from Manchester saying, we're it. We want, you know, we don't mind. We want you to reinforce the network. We want you to make sure this is transformed. The nature of the, the ENW, who I will name the, the, the entity who is concerned with that, it's, it's the, the network company. It covers Manchester, but also covers a large rural area surrounding it where the mayor of Manchester has no, has no writ, so to speak. And we were sort of then agonizing about whether or not if we were going to significantly allow more money for Manchester to uh, explode, as it were, in, in sort of network infrastructure to build EV charging points everywhere. Was this reasonable to, in fact, charge people living, perhaps poorer people living in rural areas, as it were, to fund that? Um, and we didn't really get much of an answer. I agonized about it relatively consistently, um, unproductively. And was ultimately, as Catherine said, we were risk averse and didn't really make a decision. Um, and that shows, I suppose, one sense the, well, the, it's perhaps a personal failure in this case to grapple with this issue. But it was a good example of the kind of tensions and trade-offs that have to be made. Um, I will just briefly take up Isabel's point. I very much agree with Isabel's point about competition law. Uh, it's not in itself a threat, so to speak. I saw competition law being quite useful once when and maybe taking telling tales out of school when the Secretary of State would occasionally, as, as politics would perceive to force them to do, get companies in to say, we're going to all negotiate a collective price decrease uh, on, on the companies would say, well, actually competition law prevents me from getting into the same room with my with one of my competitors and the, CEO, uh, the Secretary of State would generally be deterred from doing so, at least temporarily, until two months later. Uh, so competition law can be useful in that regard. Um, I think data protection law actually is also an issue. Um, a surprising issue. It's a specific point about sustainability, but 
off German off what did a long project to try and sort of how can we make sure that vulnerable people are on the same register, the same priority services register? Surely it makes sense that there should be a sense of the, the energy company should be able to talk to the water company and think about a vulnerable person. But no, couldn't do it. Data protection law, we talked to the DPC, who has huge powers and for a very good reason, and it was almost impossible. So it's these, these kinds of issues, these kinds of tensions that need to be resolved in some sort of overall consensus that Isabel spoke about earlier. I wonder if we could go back to the issue that several of you have raised, which is around how do you get the will for change? Uh, if, if regulation and law aren't the barriers, there is an issue around leadership, being brave, having the will to change, and potentially how you signal uh, the direction of travel and the need for change. Catherine, with you, maybe with your Regulatory Horizons Council hat on, which is obviously you're looking at innovation, you're looking at long-termism there. Have you got any insights about how to get change when all sides may be risk averse um, and reluctant to stick their heads above the parapet? Uh, yeah, we, we haven't quite found the magic bullet on that uh, just yet, but um, some, some things I think emerge from our thinking quite, quite strongly on this. Um, I think it's really hard um, and I think it's hard for any organisation um, that has, you know, expertise, that has systems, that has processes, uh, that has actually a very busy day job and all of those things by the way are good that's you know, we want expertise we want regulators with expertise we want regulators with systems and processes because that's how they make good decisions it's very difficult to get organizations um, out of that groove into a frame of mind where they are wanting to be you know self-destructive um, and there are loads of reasons for that. I mean, some of them are, 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 are cultural, some of them are to do with resourcing and bandwidth, some of them are to do with things like the appeal process that obviously tends to take you back to, you know, evidence and, and you know, precedent and, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, sometimes it's also about the fact that, that you spend, I mean, I, you know, I was guilty of this when I was a regulator, you spend a lot of time talking to the people that you talk to. They have a particular worldview, it's easy to talk to them, it's easy to have an exchange. You know, you can feel you're pushing the boundaries, but you're not really because you're all in, in the same sort of sort of envelope. Um, and sometimes it's just difficult to be part of a very different conversation with very different people. And I think that's why the government concluded on the back of the, the, the white paper on, on regulation in the fourth industrial revolution that it would set up the Regulatory Horizons Council, because the point about the Regulatory Horizons Council is that our, we only have one job, and that is to disrupt regulatory systems. That's, that's what we're there for. We don't have a day job that we have to keep going. We are an advisory body. We produce recommendations, so we don't get appealed. You know, uh, we're all appointed for, I think it's two years. So, you know, there's no sort of ingrained culture of expertise. People will come, people will go. Um, so we're set up to be disrupted. And I, th I think that's going to be very powerful. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is not only actually to make recommendations uh, for particular areas of regulatory change, and by the way, we're not really focusing on, on, on the sort of regulated sectors we're talking about here, we're talking about things like, you know, um, we're looking at unmanned aircraft, we're looking at fusion energy, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, genetic technologies, uh, you know, that, 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 that sort of thing. Um, but not only will we come up with recommendations as to how the regulatory regimes need to change, what we're also hoping is that we can come up with a bit of a playbook, which is here is here's a set of tools that you can use if you do want to disrupt a regulatory system. Here's how to do it. So, you know, that, that's kind of where we are at, at the moment. I don't actually think there is any lack of willingness in principle to embrace change. I, th I think people know why this stuff is important. I think, I think loads of people will read the stuff in your report and go, yeah, absolutely, 100%, we need to change to deliver it. But then getting them from that acknowledgement intellectually into action is the difficult bit. And a lot of that is about setting out the toolkit. So that's where we've got to so far. Uh, that's fascinating. Isabel, I wonder with your experience with clients in a number of sectors, whether you've got any insights into how to get people to build momentum and, and drive change in these areas. Or to give them comfort that the law isn't there, it's something to be frightened of. Yeah, I'm, I mean, on the general behavioural stuff, I, I'm 
I'm, I'm less sure I've got a particular insight from, from a company perspective, but I think, um, you know, joined up, those in positions of power being joined up is quite important that the same message comes from government and from regulators. And I think when you're looking at trying to drive specific change, you know, the, the question of paying for it is actually quite important because it's one thing to say, you know, we want, you know, more done. But then, as Dermot was saying, you know, somebody's got to like authorise that as spend through the price control. And then as the regulator, you are in the position of, well, does this really need to be done? Like, you know, this is going to push people's bills up. You know, it's not an easy. So being very clear at the outset that this is something that's going to be paid for is quite important to, to getting the momentum uh, through the system. On the competitional point, I think, um, you know, I, I think that is a real issue for certain types of projects, particularly ones with that require sort of structural arrangements between people because they're very hard to unwind. Yeah, I think that is a known issue at the Competition Authority and sustainability is increasingly up, uh, going up the CMA's agenda. There are ways you can go and talk to the CMA. Um, and I, I think they're probably more open to those discussions in, in a sustainability context than would have been the case a few years ago. Um, my guess would be that the regulators are going to sort of look at how that works and you know look at you know whether they can do similar things and you know it can be as simple as just being willing to have an informal chat with people and give them a bit of soft assurance um that the regulator doesn't hate their initiative and you know the regulator is not going to say everything you everything you want to do is okay from a competition or point of view but we don't fundamentally hate what you're trying to do if you go about it in a sensible manner that in itself can empower people quite a lot to keep going um, on certain types of projects, I think the regulator getting involved in the project is also quite helpful. You know, it um, you know it depends what, what it is and whether that's appropriate. But if if it can be a genuinely collaborative thing, that makes it much easier for people to come on board as well. So thank you. Some really helpful practical insights there, I think. <laughs> and we've now got quite a few questions in the Q and A. So I'm going to hand over to Martin, who is going to sort of try and field those for us. So Martin, over to you. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Martin Hurst. I'm an associate at Sustainability First. My background is in policy as a senior civil servant, including water director, etc. Um, we've got quite a lot of themes coming out of the questions, so I'll try and group some if that's okay. Um, the first theme, I think, is around the net zero duty. Um, so we have a question from Richard about whether a net zero duty would change Ofgem's behaviour or anybody else's behaviour for that matter. And isn't it already covered? And a related question from Judith is one of the risks or possibly opportunities, depending on who you are, of a new duty that it leaves regulators open, more open to third party challenge. And I assume this means JR. So panel, what do you think of whether net zero duty is needed, would it have changes in behaviour and would some of them possibly be negative ones because of the risk of challenge? Can I start with Jeff? You might. Um, I mean, this, this sort of links back a little bit to the last subject we were talking about, I, I think. Um, you know, I, I think our papers have identified that the system itself is not the major obstacle, but there is nonetheless, as Catherine mentioned, you know, hesitancy or fearfulness about decisions being made within that system for more sustainable outcomes. And I think, you know, one of the, the ways to deal with that, of course, is to, is to take away that fearfulness by giving clarity of, of objective. You know, what, what is it that the system is, 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 is there to deliver? So I think as a philosophical answer to your question having that clarity of objective and, and obviously that can be placed within a spectrum of priorities but having that clarity of objective must feed back into the way in which decisions are made and therefore um, you know invigorate you know regulators and the system and its participants to come up with those the, the, those outcomes and you know the, the the parallel to that I mean you know there is a recognition an objective recognition I think within all swathes of business uh, 
that there is a decade of transformation, a decade of more at least of transformation ahead of them, and that every single business has to envisage how are they going to operate in a radically decarbonized world in 10 years time. And it's not to say that um, for everyone who has that objective recognition, there is somebody who is actually planning what we are actually going to do about it. And I think that's the connect, the, the, the gap that we've got to fulfill. And I, and I think that, um, you know, having that sort of net zero objective might well be part of that solution of filling that gap. Catherine, you were a regulator when you faced a new duty in terms of the 2014 Water Act resilience duty. How did it change your behaviour? <laughs> you know, Martin, I was thinking about this, um, and, and you may remember uh, at the time, I, I was implacably opposed to uh, off what acquiring the resilience duty uh, for all sorts of reasons that I think uh, people on this uh, call have, have alluded to. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't want a profusion of statutory duties because it would risk, you know, undermining the focus of the regulator. Uh, you know, would it throw us more open to appeal? Um, you know, is it sort of government tinkering and that every government will just give you another statutory duty and then you end up like poor old ORR that's got 24 that aren't prioritised? And, you know, I, so I, I was really, really sceptical. And also, I remember arguing at the time that we did loads of things uh, in Oxford uh, that related to resilience and we didn't need a statutory duty on, on resilience. Um, however, uh, once we'd got it, I thought it was one of the most useful changes that could have been made um, for exactly the reason that I think Isabel was alluding to uh, earlier on, because you know, did, it, did we actually do anything after we got that statutory duty that we could not have done before we got it? Don't think so. Did getting the new statutory duty prompt us to, to evaluate what was the message government was trying to give us? by introducing this statutory duty? What was the change that they were trying to get us to, to, to think about? Um, and also, did it also prompt us to have, a, frankly, a, a very useful collaborative conversation across the industry with wider stakeholders about what everybody thought resilience actually meant? Um, and, and it did both of those things. So we did reevaluate. We did have a really, really good process that built consensus and created collaboration that enabled us to deliver change. And I think it did change our behavior. So, so you know, I think something, you know, whether it's a statutory duty on net zero, I, you know, whether, whether that, that quite makes great, I, I don't know, but I do think it, it would produce some shift in behavior. And if, if regulators wanted to use it positively, I think it could be a, a force for good. So that's my experience. Mm. Isabel, from a legal standpoint, how likely do you think new duties are new duties to be the focus of appeals can you actually hang appeals on them as easily as some people might think i mean i mean i touched on this before i i i think the duties are better regarded as behavioral nudges and steers than um things that in themselves would ground a challenge theoretically they could in practice i think it's very hard to um you know come up with a fact pattern that you know can be demonstrably shown to to conflict with particularly given most of the regulators have a series of duties which may or may not be prioritized so um so i think if i was a regulator i wouldn't be overly worried about that i think i'd be thinking about it more in the terms that catherine's described what i would say about legislation though is like there is a sort of T tendency particularly at the moment I think to feel that like all, all problems in life can be solved if you if you only have specific enough legislation about you know what exercise means or whatever else and um and actually you know what's more important is is what you're doing and legislation takes time was really what I wanted to say like you could spend a year getting a bill through setting up this duty debating what it means and actually that's a year when something else isn't happening so I mean it's 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 nice but I if it was me I wouldn't wait for I wouldn't be waiting on that I don't think it's going to be a game changer so there's a separate question from Guy Thompson building on this which is saying isn't one of the dangers of new duties that they exacerbate the parent-child relationship between regulators and the companies 
And there's also a question from Jenny Saunders related to that. Um, I'm sorry, one of the other things the guy says is, isn't the answer actually outcome-based regulation? And then Jenny Saunders asked, how would you go about getting the culture change in regulators you need for the big conversations and the collaboration? Dermot, do you want to kick off? Is there a danger of a perverse incentive here? A perverse incentive by a net, a net zero duty, a duty legislatively? Yeah, I think Guy's point is the more that you give powers to regulators mm -hmm. and tell them what to do, the more you say the answer is regulation and the parent-child, to use Guy's phrase, relationship between regulators and the companies. <laughs> well, I think there is, there is obviously some risk of that. The list of off-gem duties, not quite uh, as compendious as they are or was certainly formulating something of not parent-child, maybe, I don't know, uncle-nephew, um, as it were. But it, it's, I think in this particular case, a net zero duty, I take Isabel's point, but I think it, it, it would bring something it wouldn't transform Ofgem's sort of activities. So I don't think it would be the next, the next time a company walked into Ofgem and said, I want funding for this project. Ofgem says, yes, of course, you know, and rolled out the red carpet. But I think it would over time, as it were, give that sort of sense that, that Catherine referred to. So I view it as a positive thing, I have to say, um, not transformative, but positive, and frankly, better than a policy statement, which has never happened for energy generally because government is very cautious about policy statements and also they don't really have any legal force in any case. Um, so I think it would be good. The parent-child thing I would less be worried about here in this particular case, I have to say, provided it was drafted in a sort of relatively, not quite overarching, but a, a framework that avoided detail. Um, and I would say certainly with regard to network price controls, there, was al there is already a parent-child relationship. Um, in some sense, you can't fund anything unless the regulator agrees to it. So I don't, I don't know how it would change all of that. I, I don't think it would necessarily change that for the worse, should we say. Hmm. Catherine, in terms of culture change in regulators, how necessary do you think it is and how would you go about it? Oh, Lord. Thank you, Martin. Um, <laughs> how necessary do I think it is? I don't know. I mean, I, I, do, I do think having a culture in regulators um, that that puts them in a position of openness to change and curiosity about what society is looking for uh, and the solutions that, that can come not only from the industry they regulate, but actually more broadly to, to deliver those, those, those outcomes. I, I think that is really, really important. And I think there's always a balance there, as I was sort of alluding to before, between you know, the expertise that you need in a regulator to do a good job and, and, and do it in a, in a sensible way. Um, and what you might label as expert culture, which can be a little bit know-it-all and can be a little bit parent-child in, in the bad versions of it, um, and can make regulators not as open and curious uh, and, and, and as sort of adaptable um, as, as perhaps they ought to be. How, how, how do you get the right culture? I, I think it's, it's not that hard. Um, you know, I mean, I think if, 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 the, if the board is clear that that's what they want, if, if the leadership team and the regulator is clear that that's what they want, um, you know, it, that, that goes an awfully long way. I, I think there are two other critical success factors, which may be a little bit harder. Um, one is that the companies that are regulated have to want that and want the responsibility that that places on them and step up and engage in, in, in the right way. Because actually my experience at Offworld was that, you know, certainly when we started on this journey way back, um, even before I arrived, um, you know, some of the companies were quite happy with parent-child because if you're being told what to do, you know what you have to do and you can take it off and go, oh great, I've done what I have to do. I'm, I'm a good company and it's quite an easy life. Um, doesn't get us what we want, but it's quite an easy life. So, you know, companies I think have to step up as well and, and support that. And I think government and, and policy makers parliamentarians do have to be prepared to give the regulators a bit of cover um, and it is often the case for example you know and Dermot's been there I've been there you know you know you get in front of the select committee and what they really want uh, or sometimes what you're left with the impression they really want is, is, is a list of things that you've beaten the companies up on uh, recently so you can sound tough um, which does put you back in that parent-child space and it is inimical to, to learning and, and innovation and ultimately perhaps doesn't deliver great uh, consumer and societal outcomes. So, so getting the culture within the regulator, not that difficult, but those critical success factors of the company stepping up and getting the sort of uh, the, the, the air cover from, from Parliament, I think maybe a little bit harder. I'll just come in very briefly on that. 
I was there are no non-interventionist MPs in a select committee, left, right, or center. They all want intervention. They all want blood. Um, sorry on that. <laughs> uh, which this very neatly brings us on to the next set of questions. So Adam Collinson has said, do the panel think in order to encourage more collaboration, regulators should be prepared to take steps to bless certain types of collaboration? And then there's two related questions to that. One is from Alex Adam. Can you suggest any quick wins for collaboration? And then there's a question from Maxine around, do the CMA, and I think I would add the NAO, need to change some of their behaviours also in order to facilitate collaboration and more wide behaviour change? So, Jeff, do you want to kick off? Well, uh, uh... I'm happy to, but it may be only to palm this one off very quickly to Isabel, perhaps. But I'm, <laughs> just, just as a as a very brutal response to that, and and really to try and connect to the last conversation. I mean, all of the things we just talked about in the last question can be repeated thematically here, which is without absolute clarity of objective and outcome that people are going for incremental change and waiting for people to work out what it is they need to do to get better outcomes is the same thing as denying that change. So I'm absolutely clear that if, if we just leave cultural change to take place in regulators without giving direction from above, and this can, same thing can apply to the CMA and other regulators, unless there is that clarity which needs to come from the government to make that change, whatever change happens will be extremely slow. Yeah. And off to Isabel on that note. No. Okay, you might need to remind me, Martin, if I've lost a bit of the question along the way, but I think when you're thinking about the role of regulators in collaborative activity, um, this is another scenario where you are trading off, yeah, and in competition law, we come historically from a model when you could, you know, apply to regulators for, as it were, negative clearances, you know, approvals, blessings, and actually what everyone found was that that was an insanely uh, administrative, time-consuming, expensive system that didn't generate answers in sort of business-relevant timescales, and it didn't work for and didn't work for the regulators, didn't work for the companies. We binned it in favour of self-assessment, and you know, by and large, self-assessment is a better model, I think, in terms of getting things done. But it passes a lot of risk onto companies, and I think what you've seen in competition or is over time, there are some you know, particular categories of activity. And it may be that some of the, the initiatives we're talking about are in those where that because the risk reward profile doesn't balance out and, and that those are the cases I think where, where you need more intervention is it's not across the board. And, you know, in the competitional space, um, you know, so the challenge, the challenge is to try and address that without going back to, um, you know, a full, you can't do anything unless it's been notified and blessed because that, that is back to the parent child that slows things down in the long run. Whilst at the same time being able to get some guidance. So I said before, I actually thought like informal chats often can actually give people quite a lot of comfort, just that, you know, everyone isn't going to, you know, sick all over their plan once it becomes public. Where you've got, you know, structural investment being made, the CMA does have a short form opinion procedure, which, you know, where you're talking about, you know, structural industry collaboration of the sort that isn't like business secrets, it, you know, it's suitable to be, it's a public process, so you have to make it public, you know, that's something along those lines, maybe, you know, or it, it's not been used that much in practice. So expanding or building on that kind of model might, you know, might be the way forward. Very quickly in the last minute, any quick wins? I'm not sure about, I, I, I know, on blessing, it brought me back to my Catholic childhood, but you know, the idea of the regulator saying ego te absolvo, I think is, is really not, not, not an appropriate kind of framework and, and probably not something that will, I think, be, be, be terribly positive. On quick wins, um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick risk, I suppose, which one thing we haven't mentioned is the Penrose review on uh, competition and regulation, which will rumor has, doth, doth run before and like a barking dog has suggested, has, has actually been submitted to government already. Um, and I think these issues, you know, will presumably come out to some extent in that review, and that will be will, will be interesting to see. So I should that is a risk, I think, to the whole regulatory framework, possibly a positive risk, uh, 
I think it is something that that will perhaps may, make this conversation come with a little bit of di different emphasis if we're done in about two months' time. Can I can I pitch in with a possible couple of couple of quick wins? Um, all I would say is, is I think actually there are some regulators who are doing some really good stuff on this, and I, and I, I would give a shout out to, to, to Offwork in particular on the water resources side of it. The quick win, I think, is to extrapolate from that experience and pull out the lessons learned in a way that might be generalizable um, and maybe share those with, with, with other regulators so, so that the, set, you know, not, the, the learning doesn't just stay within the water sector, but is also shared uh, across sectors. And that will give benefit to everybody from, from something that I think is a really good example of this. Thank you very much uh, everyone for that and for all the questions that have been asked. There's still some good ones on the list, which we, we will definitely go away and think about. Um, in our last 10 minutes though, what we wanted to do was to give all the panelists a chance to really say two minutes, so really briefly, what your concluding remarks would be for this work. And if in doing that, you wanted to say one thing you would want government to do in terms of law regulation, uh, that might help sharpen uh, the discussion as well. So I wondered if we could go um, to you, Isabel, first. Thank you. OK, um, I, I think my, my concluding remark is, I think, going to be be kind that, you know, actually these are properly difficult issues and there isn't a magic solution, whether you're sitting as government or regulator or the company or the consumer. And, you, you know, maybe we should just recognize that as, as the starting point that, you know, everybody can see where they want to get to and, you know, everybody's trying to find the way there. That's, and I suppose if government, one thing government could do to help with that, um, uh, I think they could help with signaling what they think is the right direction of travel. Signaling is a big theme, Dermot. I think, I think I agree with as well. These things are hard, um, intrinsically hard. I think decarbonisation is a major societal change in a scale that you know will will need society to be you know, changed in many ways. Uh, and as Jeff said, is is not going to happen entirely organically, it needs policy decisions and, and a democratic consensus they're in, which is obviously brings back to Isabel's point is that's bloody hard. But nonetheless, it is necessary. This is not a these are not a trivial set of activities over the next 30 years. Meeting zero is hugely net zero is going to be hugely difficult. In terms of one thing government would do, I would say give clarity on this. Personally, I think clarity on who's going to pay or how it's going to be paid for. And indeed, the intimations that in fact it may cost something less perhaps than was planned as the as the ccc report showed but who pays and clarity and that would help the very final comment which i didn't pick up earlier but i think is really interesting was was jeff's earlier point about fiduciary duties and what you can expect from companies i've nothing profound to say and obviously we're short of time now anyway but i think that is one of the most difficult issues the idea of maximizing shareholder value as your fiduciary duty is incredibly has served, you know, served British industry incredibly well over the last few hundred years and is simple, clear. <laughs> is it enough? I don't know. Um, but that, I think, is probably one of the most important themes in thinking about net zero. Yeah, I don't know, Dermot, stolen your th th thunder there in terms of fiduciary duties, but what would your sort of concluding thoughts be? Well, uh, two, two things, really, which are or maybe two halves of the, sa the same thing. Um, you know, we talked about a net zero duty um, as if as if there is some choice that regulated sectors maybe shouldn't have a net zero duty. But the country as a whole has got a net zero duty, not just as a sort of moral proposition, but actually as a piece of legislation which says that the uh, our, our country's emissions will be reduced by 2050. So making that connection between that statement that's been made by the government, if you like, on our behalf as a country through to the regulated sectors seems to me to be an obvious uh, bridge that needs to be, sorry, an obvious gap that needs to be bridged, not a bridge that needs to be gapped. Um, uh, so I think, I think you know, for, 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 for all the difficulty in, in making that connection, the connection yet needs to be made. And the, the second point really just to conclude is uh, I mentioned the Schroeder's Global Investor Study um, earlier on in my remarks. One of their other 
graphs um, pose the question who people think should be responsible for mitigating climate mm. change. And the most common selection was government and the regulators. So, you know, I think, I think the force is with us here and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's open for the system to change to reflect that. Thank you very much. Catherine. What would your number one wish list be for government? Oh, yeah, I, I think there is one, actually. And I think that would be that I'd like government to give clarity on its strategic priorities across sectors. And I think decarbonisation net zero will be a really, really good starting point. It's not the only one they would need to deal with, but it would be a really good starting point. We're not going to decarbonise the economy by staring at the energy industry. You know, it cuts across sectors and, and, and the sooner government starts the you know, build that into its thinking and give clarity on its priorities at that cross sector level, the better. So I would start there. The, the list could go on, but I would, I would start there. And in terms of other things, I think to take away from, from the paper and the discussion that we've had, I, I guess there are a few. I mean, I do think it's really important that we all embrace the world as it is, which, which really means learning to love uncertainty um, and understanding the the interdependencies and the systemic nature of, of, of the world that we live in and stop trying to compartmentalize things into chunks that we feel comfortable with because we can control. Um, and I think that that comes across again and again. And I think beyond that, there's a couple of other things I, I, I sort of draw out of this. One is a real need to, to embrace uh, change, learning and innovation. Um, and that is you know, within companies about how we do stuff. Uh, it's within regulators about the regulatory regime and the regulatory system. It's within governments about policy. You know, we, we all need to, to start to, to think about ways of, of, of doing what we do with our different bits of the system differently, but also making that change in a way that enables us to learn as we do it, because we won't get it perfectly right. So we need to be able to do it in a way that embraces the learning and then that, that improves our capability to change uh, over the long term. So I think that's really important. And then I think the final point, which so, sort of strikes me actually listening to what Jeff was saying about that Schroeder survey, I, 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 I kind of wonder whether that survey that basically says, who do we want to, 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 to deal with environmental sustainability and decarbonisation? Oh, I know it's the government and regulators. Isn't a bit of a manifestation of people basically want somebody else to solve this problem for them. And, and the one thing I would say is that, you know, if we are going to have any chance of achieving sustainability, we all have to take personal responsibility for that in our own lives, in our corporate lives, as companies, and to perform the role that we can perform in our part in the system. And I think that's probably the most important thing that comes out uh, of this debate for me. So thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for all of the panel members. I think you've given us loads of food for thought and I think some really good insights into how law and regulation need to sit on, on societal consensus. And if you don't have consensus on some of these big issues, it can be really difficult. Um, and you've also highlighted the fact that these are really major issues around who pays uh, for a safe, sustainable and resilient future. Um, and that has implications which go way beyond regulation and again point to the need for um, involving people in the process. And I think the discussion around systems issues, particularly as you go through disruptive change, is also really important and how to get that right mixture of hard and soft levers in the regulatory toolkit and in the policy making toolkit. So you don't use, use um, or, try and solve yesterday's problems or use uh, sledgehammers to crack nuts. So I'd just like to conclude by saying thanks to everyone who's joined in the, the webinar today and thanks to our panel and particularly thanks to the Slaughter and May team who've given us such a wealth of insights and, and um, expertise to look at. As I said at the beginning, we'll be building on this work as Sustainability First in our final Fair for the Future uh, document that Martin is writing, which will be a major report on the implications of sustainability and purpose for policy and regulation. We'll be holding a conference uh, towards the end of March. We'll be sending out the date once we pin the new energy minister down um, and we'll be joined by Rachel Fletcher from Offwatt and by Colin Mayer uh, from the Save Business School in Oxford.
So it'd be great if you could join us at that conference as well. If you'd like to, please do put your details on our website. There's a, a sort of um, more information button there. Um, and we will be putting this on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to catch up on any of the issues and listen again, uh, please do. So thank you everyone and do have a good afternoon. <laughs>